My name is Kurt Pearsall. I'm a software architect at Apple Computer. And what I'm here to talk to you today about is a project that we've been doing with a number of other companies called OpenDoc. And what OpenDoc is, is a pretty exciting new way to talk about assembling lots of different kinds of media, lots of different kinds of content into documents, being able to take those documents, integrate them with off-the-shelf software, custom solutions, and have those pieces of software able to talk with things out over the network. So it's an assembly for lots of different kinds of content, different kinds of media, and to create new kinds of documents for sort of a new age that we're finding ourselves in. There are lots of new kinds of information that people can use. We've all been using text for such a long time that everyone tends to associate the word document with text. But for the last decade, at least, we've been moving away from using just text in documents and putting graphics into them as well. And we've gotten to the point where graphics are kind of almost old hat inside of documents. But now we're beginning to see documents that couldn't actually be represented on paper, even. And that's, that's definitely a new step beyond what we've done before. These are documents that uh, generally have some interactive character to them. They have something that's time-based inside of them. They have things like video and audio inside of them. One of my favorite examples at this particular time is a CD-ROM that I just purchased that does a virtual tarot deck. Pretty amazing thing. It will lay out the cards for you. It will give you descriptions of the cards. It plays beautiful music in the background. It's an experience. It's not a piece of paper. I could never have done it on a piece of paper. And it's, it's really exciting to see these kinds of documents floating around. And in fact, not only are we moving away from just the static kinds of data, things like video and audio, but we're beginning to move to documents which are interactive, that are never the same twice when you read them. And that's an even more exciting kind of a thing. These are things that have things like simulations inside of them, uh, or they have something that you can play with, something that will ask you questions and give you answers back. And these are things that people embed inside of documents as well. A real world example of this kind of thing is when people want to build documents to train people. Uh, let's say you want to train someone to repair an aircraft. It's very, very exciting to be able to do things like put in a video that shows you exactly how to repair a particular part, or put in a little simulation in the middle of the document so that you can say, well, gee, if I, if I turn this bolt this way, what will happen to the engine? And find out that maybe the engine blows up or it does something frightening if you do it. Those kind of simulations are almost invaluable in training people on how to do things. And these are the kind of documents that people want to build in the present day. Now, the exciting thing is, because you have these new kind of documents, and we have this new ability to deliver documents of this size and complexity almost instantly to anywhere in the world, we're suddenly faced with an entirely altered landscape when it comes to moving information around, moving it back and forth. It's going to change fundamentally how people deal with information. And that's exactly the, the kind of thing that we're trying to make work with OpenDoc. So we're going to see these new media of lots of different kinds, many kinds that people haven't even seen up to this point, animation, simulations, and so on, a new way to distribute them. And what we're going to end up with, if we aren't careful, is a sea of disjointed pieces of information. And that's the real problem in all of this. Having access to a tremendous array of different kinds of information, of a tremendous array of different types, and having no way to assemble it into something that somebody understands. So when you're talking about a giant network filled with information, there's a difference between just information and knowledge. And knowledge is really the thing that people want. They want to be able to come to a piece of information, get something that's summarized, that makes sense to them, out of this giant sea of information that comes. And the process of doing that is what most people do who are information workers today. If you sit in an office, if you put together reports for people, you're taking a whole bunch of information in, trying to assemble it, turn it into knowledge that's useful to somebody, and then giving it out to the rest of the world. And that's exactly what OpenDoc is all about, being able to naturally assemble all of these different kinds of information that you can find in this vast sea that's shortly going to be available to all of us, and putting it together into a useful form and passing it on to somebody else. OK, let's talk a little bit about the technology we're building with OpenDoc. I'm going to give you kind of the quick overview of this, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about these kind of documents, because I want to make sure that it's clear to everybody what the real requirements are. Well, first of all, OpenDoc is about doing compound documents and doing it on as many different platforms, as many different kinds of computers as we can get the technology to. So when I talk about a compound document, what I mean is, a document that can have lots of different kinds of information dropped into it. It can all be worked on in place inside the document. So you don't have to move to any special application. You don't have to do anything unusual with it. You can have, say, a, a, a document that has a couple of different kinds of pictures inside of it, that has uh, some text, it has a little 3D simulation going on inside of it, maybe plays a movie, maybe has some buttons that you can click that cause it to go out over the network and get some information. All of those kind of things may be things that people want to assemble into a single document. And compound document technology is what lets you do that kind of a thing. OpenDoc is specifically designed to handle compound documents that scale up to the kinds of new media that I was talking about a little bit earlier. So 
That means we need to be able to handle things like publishing quality graphics and layout, because the real goal in all of this is to be able to handle real professional documents and be able to ship those out over the network to people who pay real money for them. So OpenDoc is designed to have that kind of layout capability. And that means you can have irregularly shaped objects. They can overlap one another. They can include one another. They can be partially transparent. There are a whole series of basic requirements for doing multimedia. The second thing is that they have to be active all at the same time. So if you're going to open up a page of multimedia information, you don't want to actually go and, and point at some of it and have it come live right at that point and then go point at a different one and have it come live. You want to see it all working at once, all the different parts of the document up and running. So being able to have multiple activity, multiple things going at the same time, and being able to handle this kind of real professional quality layout were goals for us inside of OpenDoc, and we think we've succeeded pretty well. The other thing is we're moving from a world where we're doing just two-dimensional graphics, typically in documents, to doing three-dimensional graphics, things that are rendered as solids. And we want to be able to take those things and drop them into a document just as easily as we would do with two-dimensional graphics and text right now. And OpenDoc also has capabilities to handle that kind of information inside of it. The other thing is we wanted to build OpenDoc uh, as something that was designed for solutions building. And what that means is we want to be able to actually have interactive documents built with OpenDoc. And an interactive document is never the same twice. Every time someone reads it, it's slightly different based on who it is that's reading it, what it is they wanted to see, and what it is they did when they interacted with the document. And those kind of things, uh, you, you have some basic requirements for those that we built into OpenDoc as well. So we built something that would allow you to compose a human interface out of multiple components inside of OpenDoc. And also, we have a mechanism for being able to do scripting, which allows the parts to cooperate to provide an interactive experience for someone. And that scripting system is built into OpenDoc. It's network ready, and it's designed to be cross-platform. And that's something that's also a basic feature of OpenDoc. It's designed to be used on a number of different systems, each of them very uh, smoothly integrated with the native operating system. So that scripting system is based on something we call an open scripting architecture. And uh, it's, uh, it's designed around something that we talked about actually in a previous tape in this series, which is Apple Events and Apple Script. And both of those, uh, you can actually get another tape and, and find out more details about them. So I'm not going to dwell on them in this particular tape. The last thing we wanted to make sure that people could do was collaboration. And what we mean by that is people being able to work together on documents. Almost nobody works alone. Everybody needs to get something that they've constructed reviewed by somebody else. They need to do a little bit of extra work to make sure it can move to the other people in their work group so it gets to the right place. And OpenDoc is designed to allow you to have multiple revisions of a document that you can pass around from one platform to the next and use the document on any of the different kinds of machines that exist in your office. Uh, our belief is that there are always going to be lots of different kinds of, of workstations and personal computers in people's offices. They're always going to have to pass information around. And so OpenDoc is designed to run on all of those different platforms. Collaboration allows us to move data around without it being disturbed as it moves from one platform to the next. What that means is people can do their work on a particular platform and then bring it back to another platform. And if there was some kind of damage that occurred because it was translated from one kind of machine's uh, uh, bit format to another one, you can actually take that and go back to the earlier version and get back to the, the same data that you had before and put it back together again into the final form that you want. So I've just given you a list of features for OpenDoc. And if I were to just stop and give you the list of features, it might be kind of dull. So what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about the exact kind of document, show you some examples that make these features come alive a little bit more for you. So First of all, we should start talking about the kind of documents we do today. And we could call those linear documents, because they're really kind of designed to be, to be read in a linear fashion by most people. They're designed to be printed out on paper, and you go from one page to the next. And usually, they're, they're a lot like what people do in today's documents, maybe with a little spice added. Uh, you know, They usually have some text and graphics. And occasionally, you'll get one that actually has a little bit of audio or some video plugged inside of it. And these are a very, very important class of documents. So, one thing I'll say right up front is OpenDoc was designed specifically to allow people to do a really good job on the kind of documents that people use today, because it's 99% of all the documents that people do. But as we move on into this future environment that I've been talking about with new kinds of media, new kinds of delivery systems available to people, people aren't going to be constrained by linear documents anymore. And so we can talk about new kinds of documents that I'll call nonlinear documents for the purposes of this discussion. Now, a nonlinear document is something that would be difficult, if not impossible, to render on paper. Usually the reason why is, is because it's not, be, it's not designed to be read in a sequential fashion. If you try and impose any particular sequential organization on it, you kind of lose something from the document. You don't get all the capabilities that you'd like. There are a lot of different forms of these sort of nonlinear documents. 
things that can't be read in that linear fashion. Uh, and we'll show you a picture of one right here. It's, it's a timeline. Now, timeline is a wonderful thing. It's an incredibly useful tool for talking to people about when events occurred and what kind of information is there. And this picture that we're showing is an example of, you know, say, an open dock type timeline, something, you know, when is open dock in a ship, what's, what's going to be available. Now, these kind of timelines, when you try and lay them out on paper, have some interesting problems. In fact, there's a, a very interesting book that you can read called The Timelines of History, which lays out a whole series of timelines uh, you know, for different kinds of things, artistic events, scientific inventions, uh, a whole series of things. And when you read this book, you'll see some of the limitations of trying to lay this kind of document out on paper. Because you have to lay it out over hundreds of pages, you have to lay out the columns in a certain order, and it's very difficult to compare between what was going on in the artistic timeline and what was going on in the scientific timeline, because they're all the way across the page from one another. So if you can't reorganize a set of timelines whichever way appeals to you at that particular moment to find the information you want, you're kind of missing some of the capabilities. You lose some of the ability to read what's in those timelines and get the information out. The other problem with it is, of course, if you want to actually lay out the text or the graphics in a static fashion along the timeline, it takes up a certain amount of room. And you end up scaling the thing up to go across hundreds of pages because you need that much room to fit in all the text and so on that needs to be there. And the reason for that is, of course, that you can't sort of just leave a little button attached to the timeline and then click it and get a whole window with extra information in it. Something you can do on a computer screen, but you could never do on paper. These are the kind of things that uh, make a nonlinear document fundamentally different from what people do today. And OpenDoc is designed to let people do these kind of uh, nonlinear documents. I also want to show you uh, an existing application of something that's a really radically nonlinear kind of document. It's a system that's called Mosaic, uh, and it works over the internet. And the interesting thing about Mosaic is it's not a single document that you could read in a nice linear form. What Mosaic is is really a collection of information from all over the world, and it's all visible through this one simple interface. Uh, and it was built at the University of Illinois, this particular piece of client software, for servers that are called World Wide Web servers. And they exist literally all over the world. You can find pieces of information. And as I go through this demonstration, I'm going to jump to machines that are all over the planet uh, as I go and look for pieces of information. So what I'm looking at now is a thing called a home page in Mosaic. And it's got uh, a variety of spots on it that are sort of appear in blue and underline. And you can see them here, even though you probably can't read them on this tape. Uh, these are places that I could go and get more information about particular topics. So what I'm seeing is a list of text that talks about interesting things and then it gives me jumping off points to find other information. And this information literally changes moment by moment. Uh, all the time there are new World Wide Web servers with new information coming up on them. So I literally could never capture this document on paper at all. And in fact, when I want to go out and look for new information, I simply click on one of those spots and it goes off to the net and you can see the little uh, 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 world with its, its little whirling yellow lights up near at the top of the screen. Uh, and it's gone out to find me some information on, theoretically, another machine which could be almost anywhere. So the whole point of this is to show you something that could never be built with paper, could never be read in a standard linear fashion, could never be used by someone uh, using today's existing kind of technologies for documents. This is a new kind of a document in a new kind of a world where we have tremendous amounts of information available to us. Okay. So what we saw in that demonstration was a kind of document that didn't exist even on a single machine and was constantly changing. Every second, there's new information that's plugged into Mosaic somewhere across the giant network that Mosaic runs across. So you're literally looking at a document that's never the same twice. It's never, you know, second by second, it changes somewhere out in the space of things you can find. It could never be represented on paper because it's never still. It never sits still. And in fact, you can't even fit it on a single machine. It's spread across a thousand or a hundred thousand machines out across the network. A fairly amazing thing. Something you could just never have done with the old environment for documents. So let's talk about what I think is the next step beyond even these kind of documents. And I'll, we'll call them interactive documents. Now, an interactive document is somewhat like Mosaic here, never the same twice. But instead of simply being different because people are plugging information into it, an interactive document is one that actually interacts with a user. It asks them questions. It watches what they do. It watches what they've read. And it interacts with them in a way that makes the document different, that makes it specific for a particular person. It actually adapts to a user. Now, the key thing about interactive documents are is that they ha actually have executable code inside of them. When you run them, it's like running a program. And what we'll do now is I'll show you an example of one of these things, a, a little interactive document that I built for myself to find interesting information for me and tell me about it every morning when I sit down on my machine. The first time I open this up, uh, what we're going to see is this screen. Now, 
what basically what we have here is, that it, first of all, it's noticed that I'm Kurt who's reading it today, and it's telling me, oh, you have a certain amount of free disk space this morning. By the way, the stock price has changed. There's some new company notices, and it gives me a couple of buttons where I can go and actually see oh, what the stock prices look like or what the company notices might happen to look like. So I see, okay, good. You know, the stock changed, the stock's gone up a little bit. That's kind of nice, hopefully because of my tape. And then uh, business notes, gee, you know, look at that, open docs being adopted company-wide. We're getting the usual cost-cutting measures, and uh, we have a new VP of marketing. So this is kind of nice. Uh, the interesting thing about this so far isn't what I've been able to read with this, but what happens the next time I decide to read this document. So I'm going to step out of it for a moment and start it back up again. OK, so now I've opened it a second time. And look what happened. Instead of giving me information about the stock price having changed and new company notices, it says, oh, hi, you know, you're reading it again today, Kurt, I see. Well, there's nothing new right now, so you may as well go about the rest of your business. So what's happened here is the document has noticed things about what I'm doing. It's interacted with me. And what that means is I don't have to go and try and sort out the new information from the old. The document is doing it for me. It's an interactive document. It watches what I do. It adapts it. And it's never the same twice when I read it. OK, so that demonstration showed us a kind of a document that was interactive. It was a document that, again, couldn't be on paper because it was actually watching what I did, watching how many times I'd opened it that day, letting me see new kinds of information that are available on the system. So the interesting question that arises in the presence of things like interactive active documents is, what's the difference between a document and an application, the typical kind of programs that people have been running all along? And the answer is, there isn't any difference. There's no particular difference between them at all. And so this is going to fundamentally change how people start thinking about their work. It's going to allow people to build solutions that look like documents, that are assembled like documents. Instead of being a programmer who has to sit down, plan out a program, and start using it, instead, you can be someone who just assembles some parts together into an interactive document and makes it start working correctly. And this is about time, because when we're talking about a huge sea of information, tremendous amounts that we have to put together into a knowledgeable form so that people can actually understand it and read it, one of the things we're going to have to do is be able to add this kind of interactive behavior. And we can't demand that everybody become a programmer to do that, because most people just don't want to be programmers. Uh, I don't understand why, of course, being a programmer myself. But nonetheless, there are lots of people who just don't want to be programmers. So what we want to do is allow these people to do this as naturally as they do their existing document editing today, to just be able to assemble things together to get the effect that they want. So this is going to fundamentally change how people view documents. Instead of having static documents, documents that are on paper that never change, we're going to start to see dynamic documents, documents that change all the time, where the idea of the document remains the same, but the content changes. We're also going to see one-way communication with documents become two-way. Instead of the document talking to you all the time, you're going to be able to talk back to the document and get more information from it or have interaction with the document that gives you a better feel for what the document is trying to communicate. And the last thing is, this has to become an everyday occurrence. And when it does, being able to publish this kind of information will allow us to take advantage of this new environment of a tremendous network filled with information and assemble it into things that are valuable to people. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of these documents are how you would want to combine them. Because we talked about linear documents and nonlinear documents and interactive documents. But none of those things really captures the whole space of the documents that people want to build. They want to combine them. They want to be able to take page layouts and drawings and text flows, the kind of documents they do today, put them together with nonlinear documents, things like the webs that I showed you, the World Wide Web server, uh, the, the mosaic um, example that I gave you. And uh, they also want to be able to take those and put them together with interactive content. So that when you're thinking about building a document, you're not worried about, gee, does it fit one of these sort of rigid categories that Kurt talked about, linear, nonlinear, or interactive. They just want to be able to put together the information that's useful in the document and make it work right. Now I'm going to talk about the specifics of OpenDoc, because OpenDoc is really designed to be a standard for building the kind of documents I'm talking about, this new kind of document for a new kind of an age of information interchange between people. So, our point in OpenDoc is to be able to do all of the features that I talked about earlier in the tape, being able to actually have documents that have lots of different kinds of content in them, that are all running simultaneously, updating themselves, that are dynamic, that are interactive, that are able to combine all the different kinds of content, all the different structures of document that you're interested in into a single document, just as naturally as people cop copy and paste graphics today into their typical text documents.
So now I'm going to show you what OpenDoc looks like while it runs. Uh, what I'm going to do is open up a document called Kurt's Open Drawing. Now, this is different from what I might do in an existing world where I take an application and I start it up and then I open a document from inside it. In an open doc world, I simply open the document and it's ready to go. So this is a drawing document. It starts out as a drawing document and I can do the usual kind of drawing tools on the surface of this document. I'm going to drop a nice big area over here and uh, I can get palettes that pop up. This is pretty typical. Looks almost exactly like an existing Macintosh application might look. Palettes, windows, menus, the usual kinds of stuff. Now the interesting part comes in. As you can see, this graphics palette really doesn't have any ability to handle things like text. But in OpenDoc, that's not a problem, because instead of having to have all of the capabilities of any kind of information you want plugged into the program right up front, you can just embed something that has what you're interested in. So I'm going to embed a small piece of text into this document. OK, and here it is up in the corner where it popped in. So I'm going to grab this, move it over here, plug it out on screen. Now, let's say I want to start editing the text. In OpenDoc, all I do is click inside, and you'll see a ruler pops up right away. You may also have noticed that the menu bar has changed, although most people don't. What this means is I've actually started using a second application inside this document. So instead of having one document for any, for any application and vice versa, now I can have lots of different applications all working together inside the same document. So all I have to do is type in some text. Maybe change its font and size. And if I want to come out and continue editing graphics, all I have to do is click outside and begin moving the functions around again. So this is very simple, very smooth. Users don't think they're using multiple applications. It simply happens automatically whenever they work on a particular piece of content. Well, let's put some more interesting kinds of content in here. For instance, let's say you'd like to put in a button. When you click on the button, it does something. Once again, you'd simply embed that inside of OpenDoc. So this is a button. This is a standard Macintosh control. And what I'm going to do is move it behind some of the other graphics content inside this document. So I'm going to take this and move it so it's partially obscured. This is one of the other key points of OpenDoc. You can have things with irregular shapes, rounded shapes, and they can obscure one another, but they're still operational. They still work right in place inside the document. Now let me grab something that's a little bit different. Instead of having just a button or some text or some graphics that I'm going to drop in, I'm going to drop in a simulation of a clock. So this is something that runs like a clock. You can see it actually puts up the clock ticking. And even though I'm in the middle of doing editing on something else, the clock continues to run. The simulation continues to occur, even in the background inside this document. So if you're trying to build something that gives a, a simulation and you want it to be able to run all the time while people are still working with other things, still editing, you can do that inside of OpenDoc. It's designed for that very dynamic, interactive kind of capabilities. Now I'm going to grab one last kind of content, something people aren't used to seeing in a document. And this is one that's based on some video technology that Apple has called QuickTime. OK. So now we've embedded a QuickTime movie inside of this. It doesn't look very interesting right now, but if I come inside and click, I'll get little controls that allow me to loop the movie and start it playing. Now, once I've done this, the interesting point is, you'll notice the simulation hasn't stopped running. If I want to come and do some more editing tasks, that works fine. If I want to make sure that things are partially obscured while they continue to run, everything continues to work. So the point is, I've taken multimedia content, I've taken a simulation, I've taken traditional graphics and text, I've taken controls like buttons and human interface elements, and I can plug them together into a document with the same ease that people usually associate with taking pictures and copying them into their word processor. Taking something from a kind of an outre, professional world of being able to do multimedia authoring into something that people do every day with just their ordinary editing. So, now you've seen what OpenDoc looks like when it's up and running. The whole point of OpenDoc is to let people build exactly the kind of stuff that you saw in this demonstration, being able to take lots of different kinds of content and build it very, very naturally. So when I talk about OpenDoc in the long run, I'm really talking about people putting together applications that are built out of prefab parts, assembling them kind of the way they copy and paste data today, and using that to build custom solutions, things that look like documents but act like applications, 
things that are integrated with the operating system, things that integrate shrink wrap applications with people's custom support that they want to build in for particular tasks. And that's really the long-term goal, taking all of that information, assembling it in an incredibly easy and straightforward fashion, and building custom things that allow you to interact with this giant network, this giant universe of information that's outside in the outside world. And OpenDoc is the open standard for making that kind of thing happen. That's exactly what we'd be trying to build. So OpenDoc's purpose, as I said before, is to provide a standard way to construct these kind of documents because that's what we're going to need to handle this deluge of information that we're going to have. So first let's talk about some of the basics of OpenDoc. First of all, OpenDoc uses object-based technology. Now, in some respects, object-based technology is kind of the great buzzword of the 90s. But it is a useful technology, and we decided to use it in OpenDoc, but to do things with it that really aren't very common at this point in object-oriented systems. We tried to make sure that what we were building could work with multiple languages, multiple dispatching models, even more importantly, and also be able to work transparently over a network. And so we looked around for a variety of different technologies to see what we could find. And we finally settled on a technology that comes from IBM called SOM, capital S, capital O, capital M. Uh, and SOM is a technology for taking different object-oriented languages and making them work together. And we used that primarily because, first of all, IBM was willing to make it a standard along with the OpenDoc work that Apple was doing. And second of all, it was really well suited to work transparently over a network. And because of those characteristics, because we could get the language neutrality, so you could actually use languages like Lisp and Smalltalk along with things like C and C++ to do programming with OpenDoc, because we can handle the multiple dispatching schemes that you would need to be able to use those languages together, and because it would work over network, it was the ideal technology for us to use. And so it's the foundation piece in OpenDoc that allows the various elements to talk back and forth to one another, whether they're local on a machine or across a network. The second big issue we had in OpenDoc was making sure that it was platform neutral. That was very important to us. We want to make sure that OpenDoc documents can be used on any system, any system at all. And so we had a number of issues that we had to worry about. The first of them, a really big issue, was human interface. All the different kinds of computers that you see today have different human interface conventions associated with them. And they're all different enough that if you try and write something that works on all of them, you usually get into trouble. So in order to handle this problem, we had to abstract the basics of how human interface systems work, and we built two mechanisms that we call the arbitrator and the dispatcher to handle basic human interface issues. Those issues usually include things like who controls the menus? Where do the keystrokes go that the user has just put in? What happens when you point and click using some kind of a pointing device, like, say, a mouse? And the arbitrator and dispatcher mechanisms that we build allow us to do that, to handle those kind of uh, dispatching, to take the different kinds of events and hand them the right things. The arbitrator's job is to remember who owns particular resources, like the menu bar or the stroke of keystrokes, and the dispatcher's job is to make sure that the events get to the right place by reading the arbitrator and looking at the state of the document to make it work. So that abstraction helped us remove human interface as an issue when we talk about platform neutrality. We also had to make sure that we could work with different graphics models. Now, over the years, I have seen probably 10 different graphics standards come and go, and each of them promised that they were going to be the graphics standard that would be used on all computers throughout all time. Oddly enough, none of them have ever succeeded. So having taken this lesson to heart, we decided to build a graphics model in OpenDoc that allowed you to use many different kinds of graphics toolboxes with the OpenDoc architecture underneath. So what we had to do to do that was reduce the basics of how documents are laid out to pure geometric abstractions, things that would work well with all the different graphic systems we used. And so we finally boiled it down to three basic elements, something called a canvas, which is some context in the computer that you can actually draw into by making drawing calls, a thing called a shape, which specifies a region on that canvas, and then a thing called a transformation, which allows you to do things like rotate or scale or move elements around on a canvas. If you have a graphic system that supports a notion of transformations, a, a notion of shapes, and a notion of a drawing context, then you can plug OpenDoc in on your system. Virtually every platform in existence has those basic primitives on it. Another big area was that almost every major platform these days has a different toolbox API. Toolboxes for all sorts of different things, for being able to play things out of the speakers, for being able to talk to the serial ports, to talk to modems, on and on and on. And our basic approach in all of these was to simply not specify anything in OpenDoc that would get in the way of these. So this is a little different from, say, an object-oriented framework. A typical object-oriented framework that people would build 
the idea is to cover up everything in the platform so that it has a standard API everywhere. And what we decided to do was to do the opposite, to make sure that you could call the basic platform elements with no interference from OpenDoc. The last area that we wanted to worry about was one that we talked a little bit about when we came to uh, object-oriented programming, and that's being able to do things in a distributed fashion. Because when you're talking about being able to use documents in a distributed world, and you have lots of different platforms that you're working on, then there are some special issues. You have to make sure that you can standardize how dispatching works over a network. You have to make sure that you have standardized data formats. It can be passed back and forth. And we looked around and finally settled on a standard called CORBA, which is being built by the Object Management Group, as the standard way to ship messages between platforms over a network. It's uh, supported by over 300 companies. It definitely has the great momentum as a standard for networked object-oriented programming. So by looking at those issues, by making some design choices, we managed to get rid of a lot of what I would call the mechanical aspects of being able to work on lots of different platforms, which left us with really deeper design problems that we had to worry about in OpenDoc. And those have to do with policy. Now, the difference between policy and mechanism is uh, a mechanism is a particular way to make particular calls on a particular machine that causes something to happen, causes something to be written out to the modem or displayed on the screen. And, and mostly what I've talked about so far are mechanical issues. Policy issues are a lot more difficult. Uh, an example of a policy issue would be something like, what must a document look like fundamentally? Does it have to look like a blank page? Does it have to look like uh, a series of frames? What does it mean to be a basic document? Those kind of things are called policies because they aren't specifically uh, related to the mechanics of how you make something work, but to how you design things, to what kind of things you can fundamentally do with the system you're building. Our goal with OpenDoc was to make it policy neutral as much as possible. So that means getting out of the way of policies people might want to do. And there were a number of different areas where that was interesting to talk about. One of the first areas, of course, is document structure. I just talked about this a moment ago. Uh, one of the things we didn't want to do in OpenDoc was decide what documents should be like. So instead, we wanted to be uh, able to build any kind of document that someone could think of inside of OpenDoc. So uh, in OpenDoc, because we retained policy neutral, uh, what we did was we allowed people to build any kind of document they wanted. So it could be a spreadsheet style document, which would be a big sort of two-dimensional array of pages, a word processor style document, which would be a long, narrow column full of pages, uh, a hypercard style document, where you have pages that are only shown one at a time in sequence. Maybe it's a movie style document, where things are shown at certain time intervals, and you have to go from one to the next at a certain timing. All of those things are basic structure models for documents. And in OpenDoc, we decided that the first piece of data into the document would set the rules for everything else that went inside. And that was how we retained this policy neutrality about document structure. So you can literally fit any kind of document structure you'd like under the open doc architecture. Another area that was very interesting to talk about are automation models. Because when we've talked about doing interactive documents, you need to have a way to make programming cause the various parts of the document to sit up and do tricks. Uh, you know, so you want to be able to send a command saying, gee, I'd like you to select the third paragraph and delete it. Or, gee, I'd like you to replace the third field in the spreadsheet with some new number based on uh, the results of some programmatic work. There are lots of different ways you can think about doing automation. In fact, the number of ways is approximately equivalent to the number of computer languages that we have. Now, you probably noticed in your uh, studies of computers over the years that there are an awful lot of computer languages. And every so often, someone will come up and say, well, you know, we're going to build the one be all and all computer language that everybody uses. But somehow, mysteriously, n it never seems to happen. The reason why is, is there are good reasons. The, the whole point of a computer language is to make it very easy to perform a particular kind of task. And if you could make it very easy to perform all tasks, it would be nothing short of miraculous. So individual languages are good for individual kinds of tasks. So when you talk about building an automation model that needs to work on lots of different platforms for lots of systems, the last thing you want to do is say, oh, and by the way, the only language you can use to do this automation is the following one, because that would be a terrible mistake. People have different needs for languages. So in OpenDoc, we decided to concentrate on interoperability between these languages, to have a standard way that they could talk back and forth to one another, a standard way that they could call the various parts in the document. So this interoperability is the level that we stopped at. So instead of setting policy about what the language had to be like, we instead said, you can make any language you'd like. We'll tell you how to call from one language to the next. We'll tell you how to call from one of these languages to one of the elements of the document to make it do a command. And we'll tell you how to publish from one of the parts of the document all the commands that you're able to perform so that the language can integrate them effectively. And that was where we stopped with automation models so that you can plug in literally any kind of a language you'd like. 
Security is another big issue for people. If we're talking about a world that has a network with millions of pieces of information and millions of users on it, all of them theoretically capable of accessing information, it's really nice to be able to protect the company private information or your own personal information from someone deciding that they just wanted to read it at random. So what we wanted to do was make sure that the, the security model of OpenDoc was policy neutral as well. And the interesting pitfall that you can run into when you're thinking about this kind of work is uh, deciding that one security model fits all. That for, for any given kind of data, you can make a security model that's perfect for anything anyone can think of. I'll give you an example. It's pretty easy to go into a database and to say, ah, what I'll do is lock out certain records so that people can't see them if they make a query. And that makes perfect sense for a database. On the other hand, if you tried to apply that same model to a movie, if you tried to go to a movie and say, OK, I'm going to lock out certain ranges of frames inside the movie, certain you know, segments of time outside of the movie, what you get is a choppy mess that no one would understand. Hopefully, not the way this tape will end up. Uh, so you can't apply the same security model to a movie that you can apply to a database. So the goal in OpenDoc was to allow each of the individual parts of the document to have their own security models. And that was exactly what we did. We, we gave a standard way to allow the parts to remain opaque to one another so nothing could read the data in from the outside, and then an ability for each of them to apply their own security model to the contents of the data that are inside. Another major area that you have to worry about when you're talking about remaining policy neutral are storage architectures. Uh, obviously, if you're going to be able to put together neat documents, you need to have some kind of a storage architecture that can take all the different kinds of data and plug them together. And OpenDoc has such a storage architecture. But again, if you try and choose one particular implementation or one particular policy about how storage could look, you can get into problems. There are lots of different ways to do document storage. All of them are valid. And usually, it's performance characteristics that make you choose one over the other. You choose a particular storage mechanism because it's very good for instant retrieval. You choose a different storage mechanism because it's very good for interchange between platforms. You may choose a third one because it implements an excellent security model in the storage system. All of those are valid reasons to decide to use the storage system. So again, interoperability was the issue that we were working for, being policy neutral, being interoperable between the various storage models. So there were two key issues, we thought. One of them was format, and another one was interchange. What we allow people to do in OpenDoc is to have different formats and a well-defined interface that allows the formats to automatically be translated as data is moved back and forth between the storage systems. The second thing is we have a standard interchange format, which is based on a standard that Apple produced quite some time ago called Bento. And it's a standard way to interchange documents so they can be read on all the various systems. So basically, the rule in OpenDoc is you can have any storage model you'd like as long as you also support a bento storage model so you can at least pass the document to somebody else and have an idea that they'll probably be able to read it. OK. The last area, and probably the most interesting of the areas to remain policy neutral about, is other compound document models. As soon as you start thinking about policy neutrality, being a computer scientist, you immediately think, gee, can I apply this at a meta level? Can I apply this to the whole architecture itself? And the answer is yes. What a wonderful thing. Uh, so when you talk about other people's compound document models, and there are other ones that are being worked on, Taligen is building a compound document model, Microsoft is building a compound document model, both of those models have a wonderful characteristic that they share with OpenDoc which is they have a very strong kind of a black box notion inside. And that's when something's embedded inside a document. All of the architectures don't want to know exactly how it was implemented, exactly how it runs. They just want to know that if they pass it events, it will store itself correctly, it will display itself correctly, it will handle the events at the right time. And because of that, properly designed compound document systems can accommodate one another. So you can embed content from different compound document systems, mutually embed them in one another because of this nice strong black box interface. Uh, the danger there is sort of opening the black box, is taking the black box and saying, well, yes, it's a black box, except I want to know all these things about the internals. So the danger when you're trying to do interoperable compound document models is exposing too much of the internals of the parts of the document that being plugged inside. And we were very careful not to do that in OpenDoc. And as a result, we're very interoperable with the other systems. So now I've talked a little bit about sort of the design elements, the technology elements. Let's take a second and talk about what it means to set up an open standard for these kind of documents. Uh, what we're trying to do with OpenDoc is literally create an open standard, one that we can actually submit to standards bodies in the long run and have it be generally available for people to use on any kind of system they'd like to, not under the control of a single company. And that's a big point when you're talking about open standards. We're trying very hard to make sure that OpenDoc is vendor neutral. 
And even though I'm from Apple here talking to you about OpenDoc, OpenDoc itself is actually the work of a number of different companies working together and will continue to be so throughout its life. We mean, when we say vendor neutral, something that's freely available on any platform. And the way we plan to do that, of course, is to literally let people have the sources to it. And that's really the point. When you're trying to make something like this work across a large range of platforms, it's really difficult for any one organization to know enough about all the various platforms to really do the right job at getting the, the technology to work on them. So we chose instead the other way, which is to let anybody take the sources and port them over onto their platform. Now, the usual problem that arises when you do this kind of thing is that they all end up being slightly different. So the way to address that problem, the way that the OpenDoc group is addressing that problem, is to create a standard of compliance. Get a set of tests that you can run to make sure that the actual implementation conforms to what the rest of the implementations do. And that way you can be sure that the thing that you're building is actually doing the right things, doing the basics that it has to do to be an OpenDoc implementation. OpenDoc is being built collaboratively. It's not actually something that's just being done by a single company and then ported by everybody else, because that doesn't work either. The problem with doing those kind of things is that nobody can ever be sort of intellectually honest enough with themselves. It's very difficult to actually make up a piece of technology and take into account everything that everybody has to do on all the other platforms every minute of every day you're working on building the technology. It just doesn't happen. Nobody has enough bandwidth. Nobody has enough mind cycles to actually make that kind of thing work. So instead, we chose to have lots of different companies work together because that helps to sort out all of the kind of little rough edges that usually come in if a single organization does this kind of thing. So what we got from the various people who are working on it, and there are several companies involved, from Apple, the company I work on, we got expertise in user-centered design, expertise in understanding different kinds of document structures because Apple's been quite innovative in that area, information about multimedia, because we've done a lot of work in multimedia, uh, scripting systems, and collaboration. In all of those areas, Apple has done some pretty good work. And so we provided a lot of the technology in OpenDoc that works in those particular areas. From IBM, we got the SOM technology that I talked about, the object enabling technology. And IBM's very experienced in making technology that works on lots of different kinds of machines, making sure it works smoothly together. So their contribution is providing some framework, some underlying foundation kind of technologies. We're also working with people like Novell and WordPerfect. From the Novell point of view, they have a lot of expertise in storage systems and also a lot of expertise in network transport systems that work between different platforms. And so they helped us in that particular area. When you talk about WordPerfect, they have a lot of expertise in building real applications that people use on lots of different kinds of platforms. And so they provided a lot of expertise in a lot of the major platforms, like the Windows platforms, the Unix-type platforms. And they also provided a lot of understanding of direct customer value. Because if you're not someone who's really writing products that people use all the time, it's kind of easy to lose sight of what end users really need. So all of these companies working together are the ones that are actually producing OpenDoc. So it's not a particular company with their particular biases. This is a real open standard process, the same kind that you'd see in, in many open standards. The other thing we had to do to make sure it remained an open standard was to make sure that all of the parts of OpenDoc, all of the various subsystems of it, are replaceable. Uh, and that means not only if you move it to another platform can you replace how the storage system works or the event dispatching or the layout system inside of OpenDoc, but also if you want to replace them on the same platform because technology has moved on, because there are new requirements that you have to support, you want to make sure that all the elements can be replaced. Now, the great thing about having the standard of compliance that we talked about earlier is it gives you a test to see if the extensions have interfered with the applications that already exist. The next thing you need to make sure that things are replaceable is that you can clearly delineate where the borders of the various systems are so you know exactly what you have to implement to replace something. You also have to have clear interfaces between them because if you don't, there's no end of little compatibility problems that come up as you try and replace one of the subsystems with another system. Uh, and so the combination of having this clear delineation, the clear APIs, and having a standard of compliance means that the elements of OpenDoc can be replaced. And that's another key issue when you're trying to build an open standard. The last thing that you want to do when you try and build an open standard is not to ignore all of the other open standards that exist in the world. And in fact, we didn't with OpenDoc. So we, we standardized on CORBA, which is the object messaging system over a network that we talked about, in particular their interface definition language, because it's a very good language neutral way of specifying interfaces, it works well for a number of different languages, and it's part of an open standard that's being produced. The second area was the bento file format. Apple has made this available and it works on almost every platform you can think of at this point. It's a standard way to lay out files that contain not only text and graphics but also multimedia kind of information in a way that can be very efficient for uh, media like CD-ROMs. So that file format is another area that's just an open standard that people can take advantage of that we took advantage of inside of OpenDoc, building on the work of other people so that we're not trying to rebuild 
standards, rebuild things that are already standardized, and therefore you know, causing a problem with somebody else's open standard. The last area is a, a particular ISO standard called 9070, which allows you to generate names. And whenever we have type names for information inside of OpenDoc, we use that standard. So the point here isn't the specific standards that we talked about so much as the fact that if you're going to try and build an open standard, the last thing you want to do is interfere with a dozen other open standards because you ignored them while you were doing the work. And so we worked very hard at OpenDoc to make that work. Now let's talk about the future of OpenDoc, what it is that's going to happen with OpenDoc in the long run. I've talked to you about OpenDoc as a compound document architecture, as a way to assemble lots of different kinds of content together. Uh, in the future, you'll probably see this integrated with various operating systems. Certainly on the IBM and the Apple platforms, you'll see OpenDoc delivered as part of the operating system. It'll be on every machine, everybody will be able to use it, and you'll begin to see it more and more integrated with the human interface that exists on the operating system. Because as soon as you have something like OpenDoc on a platform, you can start thinking about integrating it with the basic desktop environment that's on the machine. So uh, one of the great things that you can do with this is something that's been floating around in people's minds since about the mid-80s uh, with some research that was done at Xerox uh, into something called Rooms. Uh, and it's a way of having customized workspaces. Instead of having one set of windows that you're working with all the time, you have different sets of windows and you switch between them very quickly. And each set of windows is very carefully customized for a particular task that you want to get done. Uh, and this is a lot like you know, what people do in their houses. Uh, you never see anybody who actually builds a house that has a room which is simultaneously the bathroom, the kitchen, and the bedroom, unless of course it's a studio apartment, which of course I remember from my college days. Nonetheless, most people don't want to live in a house like that because it's kind of inconvenient. It's, it's really annoying to be you know, in the middle of carrying hot soup uh, you know, over to the, uh, uh, the, the counter and tripping over you know, the bedclothes that you left there <laughs> earlier on in the day. Uh, what's happening in those cases are that people pick particular places, they customize them for a particular task so it's easy to get the work done. And you can do that with computers too. And one of the nice things about a system like OpenDoc, which allows you to assemble lots of different kinds of information into them, is that they become more open, more extensible. You can build extensible workspaces and people can customize them themselves. A programmer doesn't have to be involved to get all the space that you're interested in uh, inside. The other thing that will be interesting to see as, as OpenDoc moves forward is its integration with network services into these workspaces. So when you talk about using data and document repositories, you talk about client-server computing, one of the things that OpenDoc allows is that you can take clients in client-server relationships and embed them into documents. And that means a radically new way of thinking about putting together client-server applications in ways that, that no one's done before, just literally grabbing a few prefabricated parts and plugging them together. The other thing that you can integrate are all of the network services that I've talked about. I've talked about the, the giant net filled with information. And the question is, how do you navigate out there to find all of the information? There are a number of tools that have been developed. And there are new tools that appear all the time. Uh, some of my favorites right now are things like Gopher and Mosaic, uh, some of the online services, uh, and a new class of things which are called MUDs, which are places where people can actually interact with one another as if they were in virtual rooms out across a network. Very exciting kind of things to do. All of those are things that you might want to use OpenDoc to plug together into a very natural workspace for doing communications or some particular subset of your communications tasks. Now, let's talk about some of the background for why we started to do OpenDoc in the first place. Uh, what, what is it that we were trying to do? What was the, what was the context and which, what was the problem we were trying to solve? Um, first of all, we find ourselves faced with kind of an unprecedented situation right now. Uh, and we tend to call it the information deluge. We're simultaneously getting to a state where we have huge amounts of data that can be delivered directly to anybody's desktop, and at the same time seeing an explosion of new kinds of media, not just the traditional text and graphics that you're seeing, but things like video, audio, simulations. Almost anything you can think of is now available to people in huge quantities over a network. And so this is something which is rather new. Never before in history have we seen this kind of an explosion of new kinds of things that people can use to communicate with one another combined with an ability to deliver it almost instantly across a, a, a distance. So uh, let me give you a few quick statistics just so you get an idea of the magnitude of the kind of things I'm talking about. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the internet, it's a way that uh, lots of colleges, uh, businesses, and government have hooked up to deliver information back and forth. Um, February of last year, during that month, the backbone of the internet transmitted about five terabytes of information, five trillion bytes of information. To give you kind of a scale uh, of just how much data that actually is, the entire Library of Congress, literally just about everything published in the United States on paper over the course of the last 200 years, takes up less than 20 terabytes. So in the month of February of last year, 
a quarter of the sum total of the information that, that was available in the Library of Congress moved back and forth over the Internet. And that's just the backbone. If you talk about the things that are connected to the outside of the Internet, there are probably 10 or 50 or 100 times more data than that that was being moved back and forth. So we're talking about really immense quantities of information. Even things like electronic mail are starting to move into the area where you have gigantic quantities. Uh, another example, also from the Internet, there's a particular section of the Internet called Usenet. And Usenet is a way to publish articles to people out on the rest of the network. Well, Usenet has about 45 megabytes of information a day, more than any one human being could possibly read. At, at, you know, on a daily basis, another huge gout of information comes into your machine. So what we're talking about is literally having the entire planet squeezed down onto your desktop on a daily basis. And this is the kind of information flow that we're talking about. So you're going to be able to have access to literally almost unbelievable amounts of information. And if you think five terabytes is a really huge number, I'm willing to bet that within about five years, the particular business or uh, enterprise or institution that you're associated with will begin to generate that kind of data flow itself, by itself, you know, let alone what's actually going to pass over the rest of the network that everybody else is using. So you're talking about information in such huge quantities that the things that people have done up to this point uh, really aren't going to work to allow people to organize it. People are going to be able to begin managing information flow the way they, they warehouse uh, information. So uh, right now, if you're a large manufacturing firm, you have warehouses. You have very carefully planned ways to transmit the manufactured goods and the parts that are going into them from one place to the other so that you, know, you don't overrun the capacity that you work with. And this is going to be something that has to happen with information as well because of the huge quantities that are available. So you're going to see that you're going to start to try and manage the flow of information in your company that way. And you're going to see that things like publishing and not so much directly mailing things back and forth to people is going to be more the metaphor that people use in this kind of an environment. So that's all I have to say. We look forward to working with everybody and building this kind of standards for this new information age. Thanks for your time. Yeah.